here's how that works with popular culture. There, there, uh, an author named Lewis Carroll wrote a book called Alice in Wonderland, and where a little girl goes to this magical place, and one of the characters that she meets in Alice in Wonderland is named the Mad Hatter. And it was, everybody knew that hatters would go, could go mad because of the beaver hats. And although we don't have beaver hats, kids today see the, read the books or see the, the movies about Alice in Wonderland still know the, the, the Mad Hatter. But why this Red River Valley? Well, that is, you know, just a, a marvelous part of here. I'm going to just draw a little bit of it again. And so we have Canada, you know, what would become Canada up here and what would become the, the, the state uh, and territory of Dakota down here. But about, about 16,000 years ago, there was a giant glacier, the largest glacier in the history of North America. And that had covered nearly all of Canada and it had moved and pushed its way, these mountains of ice, right down here into this part of what would become the United States of America, right between Dakota and Minnesota, not named at that. And the weight of that glacier pushed down this land and created a valley by the weight of it. And of course, out down here at this sort of tip it was a little bit lighter than it was up north because of more ice. So, so the, the lower, the, the, the further south of the valley, the higher the valley ground. And so it creates, it, it, it covers this whole area. And then it takes, uh, uh, it, it, it melts after a long, long period of time. It melts and evaporates. <laughs> Some of that water comes out of here, not all of it, to go to what is called Lake Superior, a great lake. Some of that water went in to create what we now call Lake Winnipeg. It's still there, a giant lake up here in this northwest corner, this angle of Minnesota called Lake of the Woods, and the aforementioned Red Lake right here. And coming out of that Red Lake is the Red Lake River. And then down about 50 miles to our south, between the towns of Breckenridge and Wapaton, another river begins where two other rivers come together and they flow up to the north because the valley is higher down here than it is up north. And so this because of the, the Ojibwa who come in here and call this the Red River. When they marry the Frenchmen and the Métis are up there, the Métis will refer to that uh, en français, in French, and say River Rouge. And then when the English come in, we will say Red River. And so it's named the Red River through the French because of the Ojibwa. This is the Red Lake that has the Red Lake River coming out of it. It flows into the Red River, which flows north all the way up to Lake Winnipeg. From Lake Winnipeg, it continues up to Hudson's Bay. And because of the nature of water and because water survives through everything, that water from the Red River is capable of going up to the North Pole. Conversely, another tiny, a little, a tiny uh, glacier started down here, and that melted. And because now, like most lake, most rivers that run north to the south, that river comes down here, creates a river valley over in this state and it would be called the Minnesota River. The Ojibwa also were, were by a river they called Mujabuju here, the Elk Lake. That Elk Lake had a great river, they called it, coming out of it that comes down here 
and eventually moves down here and becomes the, the actual boundary of Minnesota. They call, the Ojibwa called it the Great River, and in their language they said Mizazibi, Mizazibi, which we call the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River and the, the Minnesota River continue all the way down through the country. They go down into the Gulf of Mexico, and that water is capable of going all the way down to the, uh, to the South Pole. So we are living in a unique area here in this part of the country, on this continent, because we have water that begins here and flows to two different poles. You just cannot find that in, in many areas in the entire world, of course. So, this is going to help everything be created here. And so now, when, uh, when uh, the fur trade is going to begin, right down here at the confluence where this, these two rivers are going to come together, there's going to be uh, a great uh, fur trade. And they are going to uh, have new companies, fur trading companies down there, and they are going to start working with the fur companies that have moved up here into this part of the valley, up here in, 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 in the, what would become Canada as well as North Dakota. They, uh, they set up a fur trading station up here uh, in, the, in what would become North Dakota, named after uh, a, a, a cranberry bush. And the uh, cranberry bush was called by the Ojibwa the Pembana, the Pembana. And so they created a little town up there called Pembana for that cranberry bush. But now the Métis are working for the, uh, the trapping companies, the trading companies. And so they are responsible to go out, and they go out on a, a giant bison hunt at least once a year. They collect bison, uh, the robes, the pelts of the bison, and the bison meat in, 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 uh, right up until the last of the, uh, of the uh, uh, beaver. And they will load all of these goods into this giant cart that they have created. It's an all wooden cart. This wheel stands about five feet high, so that would come up to my chin. And they want to take all these goods from this Red River Valley area right here, and they want to go down to the new town, the new city that has sprung up right here and the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota River. So they create this cart made entirely out of wood. There's not a single uh, piece of metal or, an, uh, or a nail in that. It comes apart in pieces. You can, the, the Métis can take that, that uh, device apart and they now need an animal to bring them uh, the new trade down to St. Paul. It's hard to get horses. The horses were, were still new uh, to this, this northern part of the country in 1800. And so they got a big old oxen, oxen, which is a, it, it is a castrated steer. And they're easily, uh, they're, they're easy to control after castration. So this river ox cart is going to go up and down this Red River area and go down to St. Paul, the new town that had come up down there. The town of St. Paul was, was uh, first started. Uh, well, it was first sort of moved into by a, one of the French trappers. His name was Pierre Perrault, but uh, he had a nickname called Pig's Eye. So Pig's Eye was down there, and he was a bootlegger, which would be selling illegal whiskey. He was selling the illegal whiskey to anybody who came in, 
uh, to, to both whites and Indians. And so when the French trap of French missionaries were down there, they wanted to get pig's eye out of there because of all the, all the liquor he was selling. So they made sure that he went out, got out of there, but people, when they were going to see pig's eye, they would say, I'm going to pig's eye. I'm going to see pig's eye, the pig's eye landing. And so now pig's eye leaves, and then the, the, Catholic, the, the Christian priests name that area after a character from the Christian Bible named St. Paul. Paul of Tarsus, who becomes St. Paul. On the other side of the river, uh, later on, would be, would be, uh, would be another uh, great uh, city made at, at, that, at that same area. And uh, one of the French missionaries, Father <coughs> Gaultier, he comes in there and uh, he renames that and suggests a new name for the place and they will combine the name of wa the water of the Indian language, mini, mini, and take the word for, for cities from Latin, polis. So they make that Minneapolis. So now Minneapolis and St. Paul are there, and now the Red River Ox Carts, which will go down in history you know, get that name, the Red River Ox Cart. Nothing like them in all of American history. And they are making the six-week trip, walking down through the woods, sometimes walking back up along the Minnesota River, coming out here into this part, going even out to Lake Superior, and back and forth again. And they create the first trails and small roads in Minnesota. So a Red River ox cart coming through there in, in 1820, what bearing does, it, does that have on us today, or right in this area, if we are going to be driving from Fargo down to Minneapolis or St. Paul, we'll be following almost the direct route that a Red River ox cart took as it went down. And so they walk down there six months. This cart squeaks because it has no grease on it. You can hear that squeak three miles away. It's that loud. I, I can't imagine listening to that. No wonder when they got down to St. Paul, they were looking for what pig's eye was selling. <laughs> they needed a drink. <laughs> they would load back up their carts, come back up, and that creates now commerce and recognition of this area. And the Red River ox carts, their fame spreads throughout all of the United States. And soon everybody is reading about the Red River ox carts. Soon, because of those, those uh, uh, interests with, with the fur tra travel, um, the, the fur companies are looking to this area and saying we want to have a river boat up there on that Red River. Because we can take carts up there or wagons, and if we put the goods from here onto a river boat, we can get up to Winnipeg and back and forth in an easier and less expensive and a more, uh, a, a quicker fashion. So uh, they, they, uh, they, advertise to any man who will create the first river boat on the Red River. And so a man uh, takes up that challenge. He's going to uh, win $1,000 for doing this. River boats run by steam engines now have been navigating on the Mississippi, the Mississippi, of course, for a while. And so now they're going to put them on the Red River. And this is also going to change everything. And so a man named Anson North Up comes here. He buys an old river boat, and he tears that river boat apart, and he uh, puts it on, on uh, a cart 
uh, wagons in 1858, the year that North that Minnesota became a state, and he brings it up here to this part of the country, puts it into the Red River, names it after himself, the Anson North Up, which I think is so appropriate. North Up is his name, and he's going up north with his uh, with his uh, steamboat. So that begins a steamboat trade on the Red River. Soon, after 30 years or so, the uh, the new uh, the, the new um, economic engine for Minnesota is no longer fur traffic and bison robes, but that will become forest and logging in this in this region. But right out here at this area, steamboats are starting to be built right on our Red River, very close to where we are now. There is still is nothing over here on the Dakota Territory side, but now a, a steamboat town starts over here next to us, all wooden buildings and a few brick ones coming in. And uh, there is a stagecoach company, a horse-drawn wagons of stagecoaches, and people now are traveling, uh, can travel on a stagecoach between St. Paul and the town of, of St. Cloud and Alexandria and Fergus Falls, and they're going up to a little place that they call uh, Burbank. And because they call it Burbank, because there's a stagecoach station there owned by the Burbank brothers. So this town becomes the town, becomes the area that they call Burbank. And so we get steamboats being built over here on, uh, uh, on uh, this, the, the Minnesota side of the river. So now the steamboat traffic also relying on you know the water and nature around here is uh, is going to take over the the, uh, the the fur trade and the influence of the fur trade now uh, well, one thing that you might be interested in is that that uh, when the French trappers were going up and down the Red River they really enjoyed this one spot where the Red Lake River came into the Red River, where it meant that Red River. And they thought, they thought this confluence, the forks of these rivers coming, the, these forks were, were wonderful. And being French, they, they're more than wonderful. They, they called those forks Grand, Grand, Grand. And so they called that area where they would meet the Grand Forks. And later on, uh, during this the steamboat uh, years on uh, here, after uh, after uh, Northup had begun the steamboat traffic here, a, uh, a steamboat captain is traveling, uh, you know, up the the Red River, and he gets to the Grand Forks, Grand Fouche, and uh, he's there in the winter time and gets frozen in. So he and his crew spend the whole time frozen in. And then when, when spring comes along, he gets out. His name is uh, his, uh, Griggs. And he gets out, he looks around, and he says, you know, he said, I kind of like this spot. I will create a town here. And so he creates the town named after what the fur trappers called it, Grand Forks, Grand Fouche. So that's how that begins. So now we're getting out of the, out of the era of, of steam uh, steamboats and getting into the era of the, the steam locomotive. This is going to change everything because the, the steam locomotive, uh, the train, was relatively new. It had only been uh, started to use here in the 1850s in any amount and then it really became popular with use during our American Civil War that began 
when Abraham Lincoln was our president. Abraham Lincoln became president in 1860. And Abraham Lincoln would, would, it is still regarded by uh, most Americans perhaps as, uh, as our greatest president. And Abraham Lincoln, this very, very poor boy from, uh, that grew up in the, the state of Kentucky, uh, ends up moving to the state of Iowa, and there he, he, uh, he grows up, he is self-taught, his parents, and his, his father and his stepmother, his mother died when he was a little boy, his stepmother are, are both illiterate, they cannot read or write, he pretty much teaches himself how, how to read uh, by reading the few of the books that he has that, that uh, he's able to get. He's reading the, the, the Holy Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, because those are in, in plentiful print, as well as plays by Shakespeare, by William Shakespeare. Now, both the King James Version of the Bible and William Shakespeare, they wrote their things at the same time under the, the reign of, of, uh, of uh, King James in England, followed by uh, Queen Elizabeth I. So he's reading well-written literature. And he is a you know, this self-made man, becomes a lawyer, and then uh, joins the new party that wants to fight slavery and that is called the Republican Party. And uh, so he runs against uh, four men for that office when he's running for president in 1860. One of them was a name, man named John Breckinridge. Now, he, he still has his name down here because his name is down by one of the two towns where the Red River begins in the town, of, uh, the town of Breckenridge, Minnesota. They named that after John Breckenridge. They had also named the entire county that came up here, even past our area, and called it Breckenridge County. But when, when Lincoln won the, the presidency, the people of Minnesota found out that John Breckenridge, who was one of the four men who lost the election to Abraham Lincoln, he joined the Southern Army, the Confederacy, and the people of that part of Minnesota did not like that. So they said, we do not want to be called Breckenridge County anymore. So then they named it after another politician from Kentucky named Henry Clay, and then that became Clay County over there. And um, so Abraham Lincoln, uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that he enacts in 1862, uh, because he sees the importance of the railroad, he, uh, he uh, wants a transcontinental railroad act, the railroad to go all the way across this, uh, this whole country. And it had become very popular in the, in, the, in the war between the states, the Civil War. And so, uh, when the, when the South leaves of the Union and, and the war begins, there are no longer any Southerners down in, you know, in, in Washington, so they can't vote. It's all Northerners. So Lincoln, in addition to trying to keep the Union together and managing the war, uh, does some amazing things in the year 1862. He creates the Northern Pacific Railroad Act. He creates a new agency in the United States called the United States Department of Agriculture. He creates the USDA. Uh, he creates the Homestead Act, which would give land, government land, and give that to any man or woman who was 21 years old and the head of a family, he'd give them 160 acres of land, and all they had to do was go out on the high plains and prairies of early America, go out there, try to live in, a, in some sort of sh house that they would build, at least uh, 12 by 14 feet, and uh, 
make the land, improve on the land, prove up the land. And if they stayed there five years, that 160 acres was theirs. Many of the people that moved up here to Dakota Territory are, uh, are, are coming out here outside of the valley in many cases where there are virtually no trees. And so many of these homestead houses were built with grass, with sod. They would cut down, cut off foot and a half strips of sod and turn it over, lay that sod, create a frame, and live in a sod house called a soddy. Many, many uh, homestead houses were sod, sod houses, soddies. He also creates uh, what uh, uh, what the the moral act, which uh, President Dean Vrishani called one of the greatest achievements of the 19th century, and the president is right because he is thinking about average people and education. So he creates uh, through this uh, this uh, Vermont senator a man who had just a high school education named Justin Morrill, Justin Morrill, this uh, idea of having an agricultural college. And it would be teaching agriculture and applied sciences as well as a liberal arts base. And it would create uh, military training for people, but it was the first big experiment in trying to get uh, a, a higher education for average people. Because at the time, the only ones going to colleges were the very wealthy white men. And, uh, and so not everyone was, was uh, able to even think about a higher education. And Justin Morrill here, creates this act, and it's called the Morrill Act, and it creates a land-grant college in, uh, which would, would, be, uh, would be used in every state in, in the United States. The Southerners were out of the United States when they lost the war. A few years later, we had a second Morrill Act and then that would include what had become the African-American institutions, the, the black colleges, because the South uh, did not, uh, did not uh, believe in integration of the, of the two ethnic groups. And uh, so uh, because of that, then North Dakota would end up in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in 1890 getting North Dakota agricultural college, and I'll get back to that later. So all of these things he does in just a few years apart of each other makes great, great progress for the United States. And so now, uh, when, when people are starting to move up here into the uh, Red River Valley, they will be coming in because the train is coming in. And so that railroad comes in here, and the president of the railroad is a man named George W. Cass. And George W. Cass uh, has an important job to do, because the railroad is given millions and millions of acres of land.